Good morning, public health types there in Newfoundland. My name's Doug Powell. I'm going to share some time with you. I decided to change the title of my talk. We're going to go with Food Safety Fairy Tales. How Industry, Government, and Academia Collaborate for Failure. Now, I'm not talking about you folks. You folks are on the front line. You're there. You know how to do it. But there's an awful lot of time wasted. And when you look at where innovation happens in public health investigations, it's not so much by collaboration. You work with people, but individuals innovate. Now, I know how to collaborate. I know how to coach a hockey team. This is from, oh, 12 years ago. We'll get back to this picture. I had a lot more hair. That's Chapman over there, because what use are graduate students if you don't make them help coach hockey teams? A couple of my kids are in that picture. There's uh, when we won all Ontario in 2000 on the right and uh, later. But to get back to the fairy tale part, princesses wear hockey skates. Now that's that same daughter, she's 21 now, and she came to Brisbane last year. And uh, in Brisbane, there's two arenas, but public skating and figure skating rules. Hockey is a poor cousin. And all the coaches are Canadian, by the way. That's the team I coach there, and it's five-year-olds to 11-year-olds. So it's quite a mix, but we do the best we can. Regardless, my kid started skating when she was four at the arena, my five-year-old daughter, Soren, there. And uh, they made her wear these rental blue skates. They said, you can't wear hockey skates. And I said, well, I want her to wear hockey skates. Oh, no, you can't. Uh, so she was sort of traumatized. My 21-year-old came over and visited, and... On her own, without any collaborating with me, uh, said, look, Soren, let's wear our skirts and we'll wear our hockey skates. And she went out and, because, uh, you know, had a good sound bite. Princesses wear hockey skates. And Brahman went out, that's the 21-year-old, and kicked all the boys' butts at skating. And they'd never seen quite a thing from a girl down here in Australia. Anyway, we're working on it. All right. So, food safety information, basic stuff, rapid, reliable, relevant, and repeated. But I've been thinking a lot about my friend Bill Keen lately. Uh, Bill died in December. He was the head epidemiologist for the state of Oregon. And Bill was really innovative. And he didn't rely on a lot of these, you know, mass meetings or anything. He just went with his hunches. He went with epidemiology, and he stood by it. So Bill, for instance, there was an outbreak of E. coli 0157 on strawberries in Oregon a couple of years ago. One person died, 14 got sick. Bill was smart enough to go out and collect deer droppings from around the strawberries. Guess what? Same strain as was in the sick people. Smart guy. Norovirus from a change table. This was... Uh, a car dealership meeting and everyone got sick and they would have thought it was like a food handler but it turned out that one of the staff had a kid who was sick and they went to the change table in the bathroom like this one here and the kid defecated everywhere cleaned it off with paper towel but that mother was the first one out to get the food and handled it and she probably contaminated it so Bill was smart enough to figure out that, oh, norovirus could be here. And these are the kind of intuitive things that I think between pressure from companies and between self-censorship almost that aren't getting out there enough. We know that they're there. We have to be creative in creating links and figuring out what's going on. Petting zoos and fairs. Uh, the ECA is the essentially the Queensland State Fair. It would be like the Toronto Royal Winter Fair or whatever it's called. I don't know. Um, and we went the first couple of years we were in Brisbane, and I've never seen a petting zoo that crazy. I mean, there was hundreds of kids rolling around in sheep crap and goat crap and pig crap and, you know, soothers or nukes everywhere and just awful and it says well I'll use a sanitizer to clean your hands sanitizers don't work on a lot of these bugs and in fact the UK recommends 
hand washing with soap and water only. And that's becoming more and more. And these outbreaks happen all the time. You folks are on the front line. You get to deal with it. And you need some support rather than being told to collaborate and stuff. You just need some support so you can get some real information out there that's going to impact on public health in the same way my friend Bill did. Other questions that are out there. Uh, should lettuce be washed if it's pre-bagged and triple washed? You know, you can go to a grocery store and you'll get a dozen different answers for a dozen different times you ask the questions. The answer is no, because you're going to cross-contaminate it more in your sink than already. But what are consumers to think? Because they're told all sorts of things. If you go to a grocery store, you will see melons cut up in half. Now, as soon as you cut it in half, and especially if it's not kept at the proper temperature, bacteria are going to grow. Yet they continue to sell these things in Australia, in the U.S., in Canada, routinely. And the retailers say, we just won't stop because otherwise we have lost product. And I say, well, is a cantaloupe outbreak really worth it? And they go, no, it's not going to happen to us. What you see marketed at food say at retail, and you deal with this all the time when you go into these stores and these restaurants, is all of these labels, yet not one of them has to do with microbial food safety, the things that make people sick. Personally, I like this sort of restaurant and spray inspection grading system, but uh, eh, others think it's a little too blunt, but whatever, it's to the point. You're going to get sick or not. When I wake up in the morning, I say, what can I do to have fewer people barf today? That's really what drives me. And I'm sure it drives what a lot of you in public health. And we need to capture that and promote that. The sprouts outbreak in Germany was particularly telling, and I'm recasting this story. You've probably heard it before, but because there's new developments. Now, in Germany, it was E. coli 0104, 53 deaths, 4,400 illness. I mean, just a tremendously tragic outbreak. And yet, you can't go to the University of Queensland here or basically any sandwich shop and get a sandwich that doesn't have sprouts sitting on it. In fact, at my old university, Kansas State, they would have sandwiches in from Jimmy John's that were covered in sprouts. And I would say, this is not okay. And these were food safety people. And they'd say, what? What's the problem? So there's a real disconnect between what goes on academically, what goes on in terms of advice from government and industry, and what actually happens. And I think that's the interesting interface that needs to be explored. Now, in November 2010, people started getting sick from sprouts in uh, Illinois, linked to sandwiches from Jimmy John's. I apologize, that's my cat using the litter box. Um, and then there was a separate outbreak in Washington that was linked to clover sprouts. And yet a week later, the owner of Jimmy John said, oh, we're gonna switch from alfalfa sprouts to clover sprouts because they're easier to clean. Right. Of course, the FDA went in afterwards and found all sorts of problems. They didn't before, but they did afterwards. That's my coffee machine turning off, I apologize. They found all these problems, failures, failures, failures. Of course, it's not prevented because no one has the resources to do preventative inspection like that. But the bottom line is, there is an outbreak going on currently of E. coli, I believe it's 0126, and it's Clover Sprouts, and it's Jimmy John's again. Thank you. Try to avoid sprouts. Uh, Maple Leaf Foods, we have fun with this one. It's not fun for the 23 people who died and the 57 who got sick. Um, it's still held up as a textbook risk communication case, and I would argue that that is not the case at all. It was a massive failure. They did lousy risk management, and it never should have happened. When And we get these reviews. You know, when I say um, 
collaboration is the key to failure. You look at all these outbreaks and just look at Canada. We've got the Walkerton report. We have sprouts in Toronto or in southwestern Ontario in 2005. We have Maple Leaf and then we have XL, which I'll get to in a minute. Every one of these reports said, oh, these agencies were collaborating, but they didn't do anything. And you folks on the front line are left hanging. So I think it's time that, you know, maybe the, they could actually believe the crap that they espouse and invert the pyramid and support the frontline people. Now, whether all said in 2009 there was a need for a culture of food safety, and I'll come back to that as well. Maple Leaf, they can talk all they want. If they really want to do something about food safety, rather than saying we partner with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and we do this and that, Add warning labels to packages of ready-to-eat meats. It's been done. You got all this data? Release it publicly. This is from Publix Deli in Florida. Publix is a supermarket chain, big in Florida, Georgia. They say right on their bags for deli meat, because most people don't know that the shelf life is two to four days. They say, use it within three days of purchase. Why Maple Leaf can't do that, I don't know. Why anyone can't do that, I don't know. But if they're going to talk about how committed they are to public safety, put some labels on it. Walk the talk. And then, of course, we have these other experts out there. Uh, I mean, this is from Toronto Sick Kids Hospital. And they're saying, pregnant women need not avoid soft-ripened cheeses or deli meats as long as they're obtained from reputable stores. Well, I thought Maple Leaf doing 5.5 billion a year might be reputable. I don't know. What does that mean? Any other medical advice would say pregnant women, and I have five daughters, so I've been through this five times with women, too, um, that there are certain foods you shouldn't eat <clears throat> because of the risks of stillbirth. And how do you counter Toronto Sick Kids Hospital when they're promoting this crap? But they're collaborating with somebody. There is a huge outbreak of hepatitis A and frozen berries going on right now. People are starting for breakfast this morning, for instance. I had frozen berries with some uh, homemade granola and yogurt. European agencies are saying, you have to cook those berries because there's hepatitis A endemic in them. And when I go to my local store and I try and find out where they're sourced, yeah, it turns out it's from Turkey, Egypt, and places where this thing's going. How is a consumer supposed to know? Where's the public health advice in this? XL beef, 17 people sick. The main thing I want to point out is all these deficiencies were never noticed by 40 inspectors, six veterinarians, until people started getting sick. Again, collaboration didn't really work here. Health Canada came out with guidance for mandatory labeling of needle tenderized or mechanically tenderized beef. And they say this is what the label's going to have to include. Um, Good luck getting that message across, especially when you're going up against food porn from all the chefs out there. This is a guy in the UK. Uh, the UK has been hit. It has a very high rate of E. coli 0157. Scotland's probably the highest in the world. Uh, they had an outbreak in 96 in which 24 people died from roast beef sandwiches served at elderly homes and it was cross-contamination between knives used on raw and cooked product. In 2005, a five-year-old kid died and 160 were sickened from roast beef sandwiches and they were using the same backpack machine for raw and cooked product. There's been lots of reports, lots of coverage. This is last year and this guy's Mr. Top Star Chef is saying, 
We only need one backpack machine. We weren't aware the regulations had changed. People have died from this stuff. And he's saying, oh, to go from five stars to one stars, that's just too radical. That's why you folks are important. You got to get out there, bash it into them. Uh, in Australia, there's basically two supermarket chains, Coles and Woolworths. It's not related to the Woolworths in Canada. It's a separate Woolworths. Uh, there's Aldi's as well. Uh, chicken frozen breast nuggets. Um, there's been several outbreaks in Australia, Canada, and the U.S. on these things because they look like they're cooked, so people just microwave them, but they're actually raw frozen. And the only way to tell is to use a thermometer. No labeling on these things, no indication if cooked or raw, and no verification if their cooking measures work. Uh, they're changing that. There's an outbreak going on right now with Foster Farms that's been going out since March 2013. Salmonella typhimurium. They finally had the first recall last week. But again, the company's saying, well, if you just cook our chicken, <clears throat> you won't have a problem. Yet, if 621 are sick, that tells me that there's a pretty high dose of infection in there, of contamination, and that it's not just cooking. Cross-contamination is a huge risk in both food service and consumer kitchens, and people don't really know that. You know that, but people don't really know it, and they blame consumers. Again, if they were serious about it, they would provide public data. They would have warning labels, etc. In all of these outbreaks, our philosophy is, and when I say our, it's my old lab, the people I still work with, is that we're talking about you need to be both entertaining and educational at the same time. And it's not really education, it's informing. People can choose what they want. I mean, you go and go with raw milk. If adults want to choose raw milk, that's their business. They can smoke, they can drink, they can drink raw milk. I'm not there to judge them. My job is to provide information, but don't give it to your kids. We don't sit around and share a smoke and a shot of whiskey with our five-year-olds. We know from a history of research that stories are better than statistics alone, and you have to put it into context and surprising messages. Those are the things that work to get people's attention. And that work, you know that from dealing with when you go and, and hang out with a restaurant person. You know that the stories work. So have a story. Make sure you have the science to back that story up. Tell it in a genuine way. Engage proactively, reactively, and evaluate. All these stuff, this stuff, you know, it's, it's bullet points, but it's sort of boring. Uh, you know this stuff. We're getting more into visuals. We're not very good at it, but we're trying. I mean, I like to say I have a face for radio and a voice for print, so I'm more of a print guy. But um, someone's got to write the script. But there are a lot of people out there who are very effective at making graphical message, messages, and that's seems to be what the world's running on these days. Now this is an oldie but a goodie, salmonella banquet pot pies, and it leads into my discussion of thermometers. Um, in 2007, about 400 people got sick from salmonella. The company, as usual, said, oh, they're safe, just follow the cooking directions. So I bought a bunch of pot pies, followed the cooking directions, and found that the temperature in the internal temperature varied wildly from 120 Fahrenheit to 180. Uh, it got picked up by the New York Times and the company recalled the pot pies eventually. They eventually were forced to change the labels and they now recommend that for a 50 cent pot pie, you stick a thermometer in it. Now these are sort of the staple of university students. Do you think they're really gonna stick thermometers into pot pies? The percentage of thermometer use is ridiculously low. And yet, if you read the story from USA Today last week, um, I feel naked without a thermometer anymore. I thought it was stupid too, 15 years ago, but now I can't cook without one. So, stick it in. 
Now, we have a project going on that Chapman's running out of North Carolina State on uh, hamburgers. Because if you go to a McDonald's or a Burger King, they're going to have standard operating procedures, which is supposed to make the burgers safe. They cook the crap out of it. But you go to these mom and pop places and you see everything. So we've been enlisting students all around the country, the United States, to uh, go out as secret shoppers. And we have a long history of doing secret shopper experiments just to see what's going on. And guess what? Color is a lousy indicator. Uh, that one I probably wouldn't eat. And actually, that was a burger that I took in Kansas, Manhattan, Kansas. But um, color is a lousy indicator. Uh, work done at Kansas State showed that about 35% of burgers uh, brown before they're safe and 20% are pink and still safe because it has to do with the um, age of the animal when it's harvested and uh, hemoglobin levels in that animal. So colors allows the indicator you have to use the thermometer. Yet at these mom and pop places, the roadhouse type things, rarely does it happen. This is what we found. So the US 2009 food cone code says it's the duty of the restaurant menu to disclose risk information if they're gonna serve undercooked meat. In May this year, for consumers, we advise all consumers to safely prepare raw ground beef products by cooking them to 160 Fahrenheit. When dining out, this is equivalent to ordering your burger well done. This is an incredibly subjective statement. The whole well done, medium, medium rare, no one knows what it means. And there's not really temperature equivalents. Of course, the UK, their equivalent is piping hot, which is just ridiculous for a government agency to be promoting that. Here are some examples of medium rare burgers. Here are some examples of some statements like this one, Angus beef ground on site, order it rare, because you know, in the food porn world, if you grind it on site, then it's okay. So what we're looking at is, is there actually a process of disclosure? How is it done? Is it easy to get medium rare burgers? Is there a difference in the risk communication between chain and privately owned restaurants? And what's the most effective way to communicate risk? So we order medium rare burgers. We post questions, measuring doneness. We capture risk messages on menus, and we code them. Gone through all these states. There's about 250 sites so far that we've looked at. Here are some of the uh, interesting comments. The first one is one you've probably heard a lot. You know, I've been eating it this way all my life, and I've never got sick. She's never been fine. Yeah, okay. We've, we're familiar with that. Also, you probably have the safest food in the world. Heard that one too. Um, the ingredients are good quality, so it's not risky. It's, it's just ridiculous. And then there's the server. I don't know what the cooks do. So we have strong messages from the U.S. Canada has come along now. Australia is sort of coming along that color is a lousy method, but still that's what's predominant in restaurants. There's a lot of incorrect information and there's a huge disconnect between what the server says and what happens in the kitchen. And that's to be expected. Do you really expect the critical control point in your food safety program to be the kid who's making minimum wage, high turnover, and wants to go out on a date? Don't think so. There's no risk reduction message provided to patrons at restaurants. There's an opportunity to better equip servers and we're gonna make a food code amendment. I like this guy. You're doing it all wrong, how to make a burger. And YouTube is full of this stuff, food porn is full of this stuff. 
He helps public schools improve their food programs by training staffs. Isn't that great that schools go out and pay for this guy? In the video, he grabs the raw ground beef and is then holding it against the bun he uses for the burger. His advice to these students, learn your meat. And once you learn it, you'll have it forever by checking doneness by the firmness of the meat. There's this whole, you can go on the internet and it shows you how to hold your fingers to determine whether the meat is done. I want to go with science. I'll go with a thermometer. Other things you folks got out there, you got food fraud that's just, just huge. Uh, it's unbelievable what people will pass off as something or something else. Horse meat, that brought the whole food fraud thing to the thing. And what it really points out is that food safety at retail is faith-based, and that faith was violated. Uh, in 2011, five people, including two children, and over 180 were sickened with E. coli 0111 by eating raw beef dishes. He said, we never had a positive result. So we, assure, we assumed our meat would always be bacteria-free. Um, there are microbiological idiots out there. It's your job to put a leash on them, but you can only do so much. You, you're very limited. The best companies will go above and beyond what inspectors say, and they should promote it and brag about it. Japanese weird eggs. Uh, it was actually about 2,000 people that got sick from these eggs in Iowa. They're just going to court now. Uh, I mentioned eggs because in Australia we have outbreaks about every month um, with eggs. There's a real snobbery with the uh, roadhouse, you know, own restaurant type of venue in that aioli or mayo has to be from raw eggs. They will never use pasteurized eggs. They're, not even, they're rarely available here. And they won't use mayo because it just doesn't taste the same. So uh, in November, 240 people got sick in Brisbane, where I am, from 11 different catered events by the same company using raw egg mayo. I actually wrote a letter to the Minister of Health, and he never responded. Um, in Mother's Days, which back in May, 140 people in Canberra got sick, raw egg mayo. That restaurant is now bankrupt. The year before, a restaurant in Canberra, 30 people got sick from raw egg aioli. They're bankrupt and being sued. And I talked to these restaurant people, and I say, you know, like, why do you do this? And they're like, oh, because we have to, because the chef won't allow it otherwise. But we went away last week on the school holidays, the system in Australia, you go 10 weeks on, two weeks off, 10 weeks on, two weeks off. So we went up north and uh, we went to Bundaberg. You may have heard of Bundaberg rum. That's where all the sugar canes grown in northern Queensland or middle Queensland. And we went to a restaurant, and the woman asked, the, sh the server asked, do you want aioli? And I said, would you ask the chef if it's made with raw eggs? And this is the first time this has happened, after about 50 opportunities. And the chef came out, and she said, no, we use commercial mayo. We pride ourselves on local ingredients and in a subtropical climate like Brisbane, it's pretty easy to have local ingredients. It's not like Newfoundland where, you know, local is like three weeks a year. And she said, but I use commercial mayo. My brother was one of the 220 people in Brisbane who got sick. And there's no way I'm going to risk my restaurant. And I just looked at her and went, hallelujah, good on you. So there's a cultural change that needs to go on one restaurant at a time. Of course, everyone brags about their food safety culture now. Uh, uh, Chris Griffiths, I think, came up with the term about 2003. I came up with it independently about 2006. But by this point, it's really jumped the shark. Um, 
everyone is using food safety culture and it's in all these government reports in Canada, but there's no data to back up what that means. And people are bragging about it, but I'm not seeing data. If they want to really have a food safety culture, make that data public. You know, an inspection reports in uh, New York City now, you can use a smartphone and get the full inspection data. There's no reason that can't be on every piece of meat, every piece of produce you buy at a grocery store. There is no reason. So if people are serious about their food safety culture, they'll provide the data and they'll provide evidence that they're doing it rather than sound bites. Which is why we have things like Listeria and Cantaloupe. And it just goes on and on. Look, what we really want, why we get up in the morning, we want to make food that doesn't make you barf or pet food that doesn't make you barf because there's continual pet food outbreaks. So what do we do to move forward? We've done some research. Um, more companies are evaluating themselves. Unfortunately, too many companies are relying on third-party audits. Look, I know third-party audits are part of the game. It's always going to be there, but let's make it more rigorous rather than just write a check so that you get paperwork so that you can supply a store. I always uh, preach to the companies, demand more and combat indifference. And it's hard because food is low margins, high turnover and people, safety, everyone talks a good game, but it's at the bottom of the list. Anyone that says we meet government standards, I would not go into their place. That's the Pinto defense. The Pinto met government standards, but they had a tendency to blow up. Companies need to protect their brands. They need inspectors there to help them do that, but they don't need to be collaborative. They need to be critics. And the only way to really empower consumers in all of this, which would make your job easier, is to market food safety, microbial food safety. And that is this whole range of resources. Public disclosure of food safety inspection results. Sourcing food from safe sources. That never gets covered in restaurants. Yet it's the cause of a whole bunch of outbreaks that you are all familiar with. The best companies will go above and beyond and should brag about it and should be rewarded because that's where I want to spend my food dollars, not on something that's just clumped together. By doing that, then you can go back through the system and say to the kid, this is why it's important to wash your hands because we're bragging about it. And your food safety leaders not your bosses, you are. You're the frontline people. You know more. And you do more than follow perceptions. You create perceptions. So do it. It's hard. You need to engage people. You need lots of access to real people, which you already have through your inspections. Produce evidence and go to where the people are. Secret shoppers are great experiments. My colleague Ben and Don, they have a food safety podcast that you can listen to. I'm going to be on it next week, I guess, when it comes out. Um, so if you're a real food safety nerd, you can listen to these guys chat on and on and on. But it's sort of entertaining. And the reason we do this is... Uh, because we all have our kids, we all have our families, and we all want to be safe. Barf Blog is where you'll find everything. We have 25,000 subscribers at the moment. Um, there's daily news. It's going to keep going for the time being. 
uh, and I'm still passionate about it. I thank you very much, and if Skype works, I'll be there in a minute. Thank you.